Okay, yeah, I know. Good to see you today. It's been a good morning. A little busy getting everything together. How'd you like having your Saturday night off? We didn't have a meeting Saturday night, right? So, a little break there for those that will come Saturday night. But we're into our last full week of meetings. Not the last meeting, so because we're going to continue Wednesdays on morning and evening. We've got some material to cover there before the end of the year. Uh, some important subjects on, <clears throat> excuse me, um, well, the share of there, you know, there's a text in uh, 2 Peter. I'll just give you that one and kind of introducing the idea of what we'll be looking at. 2 Peter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly first, and to all good works. So, there's some uh, other subjects we want to cover. God's financial plan, which has proven great blessing to me to be able to get into a financial partnership with God. We're going to look at that on morning Wednesdays. We're going to also look at God's um, plan for us to achieve the best health we can get. Uh, the Bible said comes on that. So the number of subjects we'll be covering uh, beginning next week on Wednesday. And then after the first of the year, we've got a series we're going to begin too. So that's some exciting things. We don't want to stop studying God's Word until the Lord comes, right? And when he comes, we'll be right with the Lord. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll have wonderful things to talk to him about. So the schedule is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, as usual, this week, our morning and uh, evening class. And then uh, Friday, it's a big day, we're going to have another drawing for a Bible. Um, as we did earlier this uh, series, we'll have a drawing in the morning and a drawing in the evening. So we have full Bibles that day. And also, you will get a graduation certificate. Now, we need to know what name to put on that. So please be sure to fill out the envelope today and through the week so the ladies are sure we've got your name and to get that on the certificate. And then from our Friday meeting, of course, we have our normal Sabbath service. I'll be speaking this Sabbath. Uh, we we'll meet again at 1045. And I think um, I think that's the number. So let's <laughs> have a little prayer this time. Father in heaven, we thank you for the wonderful holiday we've had here with Thanksgiving, and we certainly have a lot to thank you for. And we thank you we can begin another week here, Lord, uh, gathering together as we have for so many weeks. Gather about your word to study. And I know that pleases you, Lord, because you have watched over your word and protected it down through the ages that we can have it today to study. So I ask, Lord, that you will be with us once again this morning, draw near through your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see and ears to hear your word, and we'll receive the blessing of that for us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, today we are in... The subject on Mystery Babylon the Great. Remember, I told you quite a while ago now that one of the themes in the Bible is the theme of woman, referring to God's church. And, and that began in Genesis 3.15. You might remember Adam and Eve had sinned, and God is talking to Satan. You know, he was in the form of a servant. And God told Satan, I'm going to put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, your seed and her seed. So right there was the first use of woman to refer to God's people. And you've got that theme going all the way through the Bible. And there's that principle, repeat and enlarge. That's how we learn. That it'll put forth a, a concept, and then through the Bible it repeats it and enlarges upon it. And we... As we've just seen recently, if you go to Revelation chapter 12, uh, you see the woman again referring to the church. And verse 1 said, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and under her feet a 
her head of crowns, 12 stars. So we see that the same woman, God's church, in the book of Revelation, of course. So from Genesis through Revelation, there's the woman, the pure woman, the church, also called the bride, right? The bride of Christ. Christ is the bridegroom, and the church is the bride. Uh, the, the church is betrothed to the bridegroom, is committed to the bridegroom, and the church has promised to be faithful to the bridegroom. Now, there's another woman, which we're going to look at today. There's another woman in the book of Revelation, uh, which is contrasted with, the, with God's church, the pure woman, those who are faithful to God, and this woman is what we call, call studying today about the great harlot, Babylon. And why is uh, she called a harlot? Is because, again, the woman in the Bible, the symbolic, the symbolism, is to be faithful to the bridegroom. But the harlot, instead of being faithful, turned to another and has been obedient to the other, and that's the enemy of Christ, and has uh, been used by Satan to bring in a lot of falsehood, uh, lead people away from Jesus Christ, uh, and that's what we're going to see this day. And we've seen that all the way through this series, but we're going to look specifically at this Babylon the Great Harlot today. So as we get into the first question, number one, God's final three-point message of love and mercy is being taken to the entire world in our day. Revelation 14, 6 to 12. And we've been looking at this. Remember, the first one is calling the gospel to the world in the context of the judgment. And it says, worship God that made heaven and earth. See, so worship God as creator. That brings in the sound, of course. This is the first angel's message. And that the judgment, a proclamation, the hour of his judgment is come. Well, remember when the judgment began? 1844. So this message has been preached since 1844 through our day. That's the first message. And the second one is what we're going to especially be looking at today about Babylon fallen. And the third is the warning against worshiping the beast and do not receive the mark of the beast. And we looked at that. So as it says here, what is the second part of that message? Revelation 14, 8. So let's go ahead and read just that part of it. He says, and there followed another angel, this is the second, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So the message is, Babylon is fallen. There, there's some uh, dichotomies in the book of Revelation. There are two women, as we're talking about today. The bride of Christ, in the harbor, who's proved unfaithful to Christ. Uh, there are two cities, Babylon and spiritual Jerusalem. God's people are symbolic pictures being Jerusalem. And as we saw in another, another study, there are two mountains. <laughs> One is Mount Zion, of which God's people are pictures of the mountain, symbolically speaking there. And the other mountain, as we saw in the study, I think it was south before last, and the seven last plagues, Armageddon, Har, Mount Megiddo. And that's where Satan is gathering those, and they'll be destroyed. So you got two mountains, two cities, two women. You got some parallels going through here. So he's saying here that Babylon has fallen, that, that great city, the, the counterfeit to, to God's true city. What is God's command regarding Babylon, and to whom is it given? Well, we just read it here. He says, come out of her, my people. You see, there are many sincere Christians scattered throughout Christendom and all the churches. But there's only one truth, right? Take, for instance, the Sabbath. There's only one true Sabbath. Now, there's many sincere Christians who don't know that. And so God is giving the warning today, the three angels' message going out to the world, and he's taken his truth. This is what gathers, the truth of God's word. And as men and women come to understand the truth of God's word, they choose to take their stand on the side of truth. And that's how we come out of falsehood. As Babylon, as we'll see, is referring to falsehood. 
The wine infuses the mind. <laughs> a falsehood. So the call is come out of falsehood. Turn away from false teachings out there and take your stand on the side of truth. So come out of her, my people. Some say that Babylon refers to the literal Babylon, uh, biblical city of Babylon restored. What does the Bible say concerning this? Well, I've got the text over here in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 13, 19 to 21. This was a prophecy by God against Babylon. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms. And by the way, at one time, the city of Babylon was magnificent. Time of Nebuchadnezzar back then. Beautiful, beautiful city. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of Chaldees, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. So, we find here, what did God say about the little silly city of Babylon? It would never be inhabited. And there's ruins of it in, in Iraq. Um, it's more or less an archaeological site. If I remember right, I think uh, Saddam Hussein, he was doing some restoration of it, if I remember right. And uh, so, it, you know, there's, there's parts of it over there. But it's, it's not a city, and it's not inhabited. And that's what God said would be the case. Another fulfillment of prophecy, by the way, showing God's word is true. Number four, what reasons does God give for telling his people to come out of Babylon? Well, let's go to Revelation 18. And we're going to notice two through five. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen is fallen, is become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, in the cage of every unhindered bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich in the abundance of her delicacy. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So we've got a whole list of things here. Babylon's become a habitation of devils. Why would that be? God and holy angels dwell where God's word appears and where God is praised. Well, the opposite then is where God's word is rejected and false teachings come and that is certainly not giving praise to God, and that opens the way for the evil angels to come, fallen angels. So it's become a habitation of devils. So that in itself is clear indication. God's word is, is not really upheld there. A battle has become the hold of every foul spirit. So that's saying the same thing. Uh, in another way, there, I told you about this, there's what's called Bible, uh, Hebrew parallelism, uh, it will say something one way, then it'll turn around and say it again a different way. That's a parallel statement, making kind of the same statement. So, evil spirits, foul spirits. Also, all nations are drunk of her wine. Wine. That theme runs through, uh, through this, and there's, there's a true wine. Um, we saw that, that study. Um, in the, I think it was the seals, it says, hurt not the oil and the wine. Uh, there was some truth there during that time that God, God didn't let totally get destroyed. So there's a true wine, um, and there's the her wine, <laughs> the false wine. 
And when you think of wine, um, if you've ever seen somebody drink too much wine, what does it do to the brain? They don't quite think so well, do they? And that's, that's what's happening here. You see, God wants us to understand truth. But Babylon teaches falsehood, counter-teachings to God's truth. That's one Babylon. And I can tell you through the years, I've probably given thousands of Bible studies and, and given presentations like this. Um, someone that comes to God's Word with little or no background, but open, many times it's easier for them to, to read it and see it and say, well, okay, that's what it says than it is for somebody that's been really immersed in the wine of Babylon. Because, now they're honest people, I'm not saying they wouldn't be honest people, they're sincere. But they've been so immersed in some false teachings. I give you one little idea with me, even though I wasn't really active in any church, but I grew up with the idea uh, Sunday was the right day. Never studied it out, uh, but that's what I was raised with. Go to, you know, today you're supposed to go to church. Um, but we didn't go. <laughs> but um, when I came to understand Sabbath, I saw it with my head, but it didn't feel right. Why was that? Because I had a little wine of battle on it, which was trying to confuse my thinking. <coughs> um, but I, I decided, and I learned this by the way with God's Word, you can't just go on feeling, you've got to go on the like, thus says the Lord. Because sometimes your feelings might take you the other way. Uh, but if the Word says it, and I discovered this too, when you step out on truth, your feelings will follow in due time. I found that to be the case. Uh, and now, there's no question, Sabbath, it, it, I know it's correct intellectually from the Word, and it feels right. In fact, it would feel weird <laughs> to totally turn away from the Sabbath and start just going to church on Sunday. So feelings are a little different than what we see. And so the wine of Babylon can have a, a pretty strong, potent effect on individuals that are honest. They can be very honest people, but sometimes these false teachings, it, the wine can create a little confusion in the mind for a while. But I thank God we have the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit can come through with all of us and open our eyes to see the truth. Because that's where the, he's the teacher. And without the Holy Spirit, the wine of Babylon would just have full control. But all nations are drunk of her wine. So that's telling you that the majority of the world at the end of time, vast majority, will be going along with the false teachings of Babylon. Kings of earth have committed fornication with her. Again, fornication is, is um, uh, in a in moral sexual relationship. The, this is all spiritual. The correct intimate relationship spiritually is with Jesus. That's the correct. And if we turn away from Jesus, then we're going into spiritual adultery, spiritual fornication. And so she, Babylon, has led others to turn from the true Christ, the true bridegroom, and to go with another the form, spiritual fornication. It says, but he's saying that he does not want those in Babylon to be partakers of her sins. And that makes it very clear. Sin is, is uh, transgression of the law, turning from the Word of God. That'll fix again. The wine goes away from the Word. Turn from her sins. God doesn't want anyone to go after falsehood. Believe that. And He says that she received not her place. Remember, God does not want anyone to receive the seven last place. None of us have to, and that's why He's calling people on the battlefield. He says, come out of her, turn from those sins, reject her wine, <laughs> take your stand on the side of truth, and if we do that, we will not receive the seven last plagues. We have a study on that. He says, her sins have reached up to heaven. Sometimes when we look in the world, and there's terrible things going on in this world, things that I'm not even aware of, but every now and then you hear about something, you say, oh, I can't believe that that's going on. Um, I mean, I just heard the other day on the news, in, in Libya, I guess, they're selling people as slaves. Unbelievable what's going on in the world. It's, oh, terrible stuff. And sometimes, you know, you, you 
You may wonder, God, are you seeing this? Of course he's seeing it. He's seeing all of it. And it's going to come to a point that these sins, he sees it, and they're building up. And when it says her sins have reached heaven, that means they've reached a tipping point. God is going to act. And we had a study in that too about God's wrath. And God has remembered her iniquity. Same idea. Reached to heaven. And another way of saying it. Remembering her iniquities. Her sins. Under what symbolism does God picture Babylon in Revelation 17, 1-5? Well, let's go to 17. And 1-5. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, that's the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. I think you get the idea what it's talking about. They've been drunk on the false teaching, it's confused their thinking, and their behavior is out of harmony with God's will and word. Just like literal wine to, you know, too much literal alcohol affects the thinking and causes us to say things and do things that are definitely out of harmony with God's will. You know, same thing spiritually. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman set upon a scarlet colored beast full of names and blasphemy, having seven hands and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. You're seeing the worldliness here. Um, the, one of the underlying principles of Babylon is worldliness, worldly power, worldly wealth. And you're seeing this, you know, pearls and gold this. And then five, verse 5, <clears throat> upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. So as we, as we fill in here, notice the symbolism, a whore writing on the beast. Um, and again, this is contrasting with God's true church, as we saw in Revelation 12, 1. What is Babylon the Great called in Revelation 17, 5? We just read that. She's called the mother of harlots. Now, what's kind of interesting, as you see in your note here, by the way, underneath that question, question um, six, uh, the kind of couple of sentences down, the great Roman church claims openly to be the mother church. You ever heard that? Mother church. And repeatedly makes public appeals to her separated children to come back. And I will say this, um, there's been more and more favor coming between the Protestant world and the Roman Catholic world in many ways. Um, there's kind of declarations going forth that now there's really no difference in the teachings of salvation between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant churches. So we're really seeing coming together, um, maybe not in name, and maybe not in organization, but definitely in a kind of a harmony in beliefs. Um, and that's why she's called the mother of Harlot. She has influenced these other churches uh, to follow her teachings uh, instead of the teachings of God's Word. And so as, as you look at the system here, review some of the evidence of the papacy that one referring to the papacy and some of the things that she's done. Um, you notice under question 7.8, the beast, the woman writes on the same beast picture in Revelation 13. We saw in Revelation 13 that that is the papal power, the Antichrist. You might recall I told you the word anti. Usually we think of the word anti as against, but actually in the Greek, the word means substitute. So the Antichrist is a power 
that seeks to substitute itself in the place of Christ. And we've seen that in Revelation 13, we saw that in Daniel 7, we, we see that here this as well. And notice also, maybe I'll go back here, under your note of question 7, uh, when you look at um, part B, she persecutes, we've seen that. You notice Revelation 17, 6, it says, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So here's the persecution. We saw the persecution in Revelation 13, uh, in Revelation 12, and we saw the persecution in Daniel 7. Uh, so, same power. This is that repeat in large principle. The same power is talked about and giving you more and more information as it goes through these processes. And then in Revelation 17, 18, this is point C under number seven. As you look at 17 and 18, and the woman which you saw is that great city which reigned over the kings of the earth. Well, remember, this is history and review for us. Remember where the papal power received its power? Where did it receive it from? Back in 533 AD, Justinian, who was the emperor of Rome, he made a decree that the bishop of Rome was to be supreme in the church. And remember, I, as we read, there were wars, and everybody agreed with it. Who ruled like Van is Ostrogoths fought it, those three were overthrown. And by 538, the bishop of Rome was supreme over the church. That, that's, ooh, I don't find that. Everything you see in the world today comes from somewhere. And so you might ask in a logical, why, why is the Pope in Rome? <laughs> why is he not in Jerusalem? Or why is he not somewhere else? Well, this is why. Because the bishop, the, because the emperor of Rome gave the Pope his power and authority. Right there, declared him the top one. And then, as the pagan Roman Empire went down in power, then you get this holy Roman Empire and the papal power getting stronger and stronger. Where actually kings throughout Europe would yield to the decrees of the popes. And the reason they could do that, if, uh, if there was a country that wasn't going along with the teachings of the church, the, uh, the Pope could make a decree. I don't know if it's called anathema. Mm -hmm. He could make a decree where none of the, the sacraments could be carried out in that part of the world. Now you and I, think, well, I can go to Jesus and pray and have forgiveness. But back then, the people didn't have the Bible. And they believed and by the way, the Roman Catholic Church it, it had what's called saving sacraments. You have to go through the sacraments to be saved. They're called saving sacraments. And, and if, if you're back then in the dark ages and you believe you have to have your baby christened and you have to go through these sacraments if you're going to be saved, you have to go to the priest to be forgiven. And if all of a sudden, no, that's terrifying. And that put a whole lot of pressure on the king in that area, the ruler in that area. And so that's how the papal power was able to sway so much authority over Europe during those dark ages. And that's why they didn't want the people to have this. And that's what part of the Reformation was all about. Bring this to the people. Because if the people got this, guess what? Oh, I don't have to do this, that, or the other thing that the church is teaching. That's what it says. That, that was the controversy all going on back then. And so that's why it says here that um, God is power from the paper power, point, point C, and then persecute. Now, as we go to question eight, what is the source of the name Babylon? Well, let's go to Genesis. We'll find out. Genesis 10.
maybe while we're getting there, have you ever heard days of holy obligation? Yes. Yeah, Roman Catholic background. My, my wife's mentioned that to me. She's raised Catholic. You see, there are certain days you really need to go to church on. And those are the special days, like Easter and Christmas and stuff. Okay, let's go to um, Genesis 10. And we're going to look at verse 9 and 10. Start with it. It goes way back where Babylon came from. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babylon, and Ernan, and the cave, and Calvin, in the land of Shinar. So there you're first seeing the name Babel. And then if you go to chapter 11, verse 5 to 9, remember they started building this, this big tower. Um, God had promised there would never give me a flood. And he said, every time you see the rainbow, that's my rainbow promise. Uh, don't have to worry about a flood again. Well, they said, we don't believe in God. We're going to build a tower. So if the flood did come, we'll be safe. And it's, it's really salvation by works, if you want to put it that way, instead of faith in God. Okay, notice what he said. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to and let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore, it is, the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did there and found the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad from the face of all the earth. Now, filling in the blank, the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did and found the language of all the earth. Now, it makes sense. Who was saved in the flood? No. And his three sons. Did they speak the same language? Yes. They came out of the ark. The population started growing again. Did they all speak the same language? Yes. Because <laughs> they got it from Noah. Okay. Well, they were speaking the same language and they started building this tower in opposition to God's will and God confounded their language. And then you got a scattering, and they went to different parts of the, of the world in time. And, and that's where um, you've got the different groups that migrated. Some went toward Europe, some went toward Asia, some went down toward Africa. You got the migration of these different groups. And that's where you get different language groups. You've got your Romance languages, you've got your Germanic languages, the Slavic languages. And I was talking to a fellow when I was pastoring in Connecticut at New Haven, Yale University is at New Haven. So there's some smart people there. <laughs> and I was talking to one of the young guys that was working on his um, doctor, I guess, on language. And I was asking him about, because uh, he was studying some way, some language that goes so far back, and whatever. Uh, but he knew all about languages and Greek and Hebrew and all that. And I asked him, I said, you know, it, when you see all the different languages, is there a common root or, you know, and he says, no, that the language is just sort of, you can't trace them back to one. And you know, logic would tell you that you, all languages should be somewhat related, right? And they should all go back to one source, and then, and then they may change a little. Like, for example, uh, English is a Germanic language. And the Germans, right? Way back when, went over to England. And started. That's why Hitler didn't want to fight England because he felt, well, they're kind of related to us. Okay. Um, so you you think you know that these languages will go back to a common source, but they don't, and that in itself again supports the Bible because it tells us there is no common source for the different language groups. Just one day. 
Some spoke Spanish, some spoke German, some spoke whatever else. <laughs> they couldn't communicate with each other, and they went off in their language groups. So in this very scientific statement uh, on sociology and so forth, that's where it came from. And so that's why the Babylon carries the deep meaning of confusion. Uh, Babylon confuses truth, uh, and that's Satan's plan. Always take people away from that truth. What is it that causes the confusion of spiritual Babylon? Well, we've, we've read these. He says here, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And we've again we've been talking about that, the wine of false teaching. It confuses the mind and it causes the vast majority of the world, sorry, sorry to say, to reject the truth of God's word. In Revelation 14:8. What specific reason does God give for punishing Babylon and calling people out? Well, he says here, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of fornication. So, there it is again. And again, the wrath of fornication, spiritual adultery, turning from the true God, from the teachings of the true God, basically to Satan. I mean, I know it's Satan but turning away from God. If you turn away from God, there's only one other option of who you're serving. And that's Satan. And that's the spiritual fornication. So we look at some of the uh, Babylon's teachings of wine that are unscriptural and thus bring confusion uh, among people. We've got these in the note on question 11 and they kind of listed here. Ten Commandments. Remember we talked about that? And the Ten Commandments. In the Bible, the first four, you go to, if you look at Exodus 20, the first four, you know, have no other gods, and then you don't worship me through images, you don't bow down to images. And then the third one, don't take my name in vain. And then the fourth one is, remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. So the first four inform us of how we show love to God, how we respect Him, how we honor Him. The last six have to do with their fellow man. And the, and the fifth one, honor thy father and mother. And by the way, there's an interesting progression. I won't get into that here. There's, there appears to be a progression in the commandments. Like, for instance, this led to the one with, with man. Where do children learn to respect God and other human beings? In the family. And the first one that has to do with their relationship with one another has to do with the family. I don't like father and mother. And then, by the way, that's why Satan attacks the family. If he can attack the family, break up the family, destroy the family, the family is the foundation unit of any culture, of any country, of any church. <laughs> and if you have strong families, you're going to have a strong culture, a strong country. But Satan, God established the family in the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve, and he said, read the throat, multiply. One of the first things he did was he knew that was the foundation. And he also established the seventh day in the garden, right? The seventh day Sabbath. Well, we're on the other side, and Satan has attacked both viciously. He's got his reasons. So that's the Ten Commandments in the Bible. What has what the papal power done? What's the wine? Well, when it comes to the Ten Commandments, if you read a catechism, it omits the second commandment, which says, don't make any images or bow down to them. That one's not there in the catechism. Now, how do you make up the difference to have ten? They take the tenth one and divide it up. So you got two in company. And also, as we've studied, they change the fourth. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, six days later, the seventh day, the seventh day is the Sabbath. They changed it, moved it over to the first day. So that's the line of Babylon. Again, getting away from God's commandments. One of them. Another one, again, Sunday sacredness, which ties into that. Having a second chance. That's not biblical. We've, we've looked at that as, as 
Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Just like when the flood came, was there a second chance in the flood? No. Oh. If you weren't in the boat when the flood came, it was over. No second chance. Sacred rapture, the idea of, um, it's very popular, that someday Christ is going to come secretly, and there's going to be some people that just zapped, secretly raptured away. We studied the second coming early on. Is the second coming secret? <laughs> it's noisy. <laughs> it's bright. Every eye shall see him. I mean, you know, there's so many scriptures there. This came out of the uh, 1800s, by the way. This teaching on Margaret McDonald, I believe it was. She had some something given to her from the Lord. That's when she's in some kind of static experience. But it's become popular in the church. Eternal torment, we studied that. What a satanic teaching. When you really think about it. Trying to teach others that God is so vengeful that he will torture people. Torture them where they're in conscious torment. Forever. Maybe they're a bad person and maybe they lived 80, 90 years. But if you want to look at justice, <laughs> Is being tortured forever, never, 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 never. Just for 80 years of a terrible life. I'm just looking from a justice point of view. But it says so much against God. But you know, the false teaching about death is a real moneymaker. Because you can do certain things in order to get those people out of purgatory. Immortality of the soul, same idea. That goes along with eternal torment and purgatory and all that. False teachings. Counterfeit baptism. Originally baptism by immersion. Now it's sprinkling or whatever. Counterfeit, counterfeit, counterfeit. Substitute the word of God. Why? And I gave you some of these before. The false teachings of why not one. Veneration of angels and dead saints, worship of Mary. You might recall I told you back back in the beginning um, when Constantine became a Christian. Uh, Constantine uh, he wants to unite the empire. Now that's understandable. And there were pagans and Christians, and so he's he's wanting to bring together the pagans and Christians, and so he starts bringing in pagan teachings, but giving them Christian you know terminology. And every pagan religion has a female goddess. And the pagans were used to worshiping a female goddess. Okay, let's call her Mary. And there's the worship of Mary. That's how these things came in. Pray to Mary, worship of the cross, images, relics. That goes right against the second commandment, which they took out. Canonization of dead saints. Um, the reason you pray to saints is the idea that, false teaching, of course, that saints are so righteous that they've got extra merits. You see, in the Roman Catholic theology, it's kind of like when you die, here's the scale. Here's your bad deeds, and here's your good deeds. If your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you're in. You're in. If your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, you're out. And so if you're gonna love them in purgatory, then you do some things to help them get a few more good deeds. So you can get them out of there. Use your money involved. Or you pray to saints because they got extra, extra, extra good deeds, merits. So you pray to a saint so they can take and apply their merits to you in your behalf for whatever you're praying for. That's the thinking behind it. Totally unscriptural. Celibacy of priesthood. Whoop. Uh, rosary, indulgences, remember that you, you pay for, get forgiven. Inquisition, confession of sins to the priest. Church tradition, equal authority of the Bible. False teaching, why the Babylon? All the way down. Okay, now we get into a section of papacy, past, present, and future. Let's notice what we've got here. How does God describe the beast in Revelation 17, 8? Let's go back over there. So 
1780. The beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Interesting expressions. So how does God describe this beast? The beast that was, is not, it is. So, and when you look at these, um, these different aspects of it, Um, what we're going to look at, and I think we have this, oh, that slide on that. Yeah, we do. Okay. Um, you see your note on the next page, page six at the top? Was refers to the papal power during its reign of 1260 years, 538, 1798. Part of it. Persecuted. Then is not, remember, received a deadly wound. Lost his power. And then it is, okay, it, it started coming back in power. Uh, one of the big steps I mentioned to you, February 11, 1929, Mussolini, who was the dictator of Italy at the time, signed the Vatican back over the papacy. So they got their property on back. And he is, the, the Pope is continuing to grow in power all over the world. That's the yet is uh, segment <coughs> Now, as we go to number 13, the mountain prophecy represents a king or nation. You see that in Jeremiah. What nations or powers are represented by the seven mountains of Revelation 17, 9 to 11? Let's go to 9 to 11. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And there are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue for a short space. And the beast that was, it is not, and even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goes into perdition. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, which received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. Now, let's notice here, these powers, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, which would be kingdoms. And so, five are fallen. Now, this is getting back to prophecies we've looked at in the past. You've got Babylon. Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, and the papacy that ended its power in 1798. So those five have gone off the stage of history. One is, that's the papacy from the deadly wound to recover. We're living in that time now. And one not yet, not yet to come, Papacy from its recovery and to the ten, ten king support. So the papacy will gain full authority in due time. And as we looked in Revelation 13, it will enforce Sunday. That's where you get into the mark of the beast. And all. We looked at that in the past. That's coming. And you will have the nations of Europe supporting it. And in the United States, this is where you get the image. We've looked at all that. It says he's the eighth. So the eighth is a papacy during the Ten Horns Confederacy when the nations of Europe are supporting the papal power. And that's that time period. What do the Ten Horns represent? Revelation 17, 12, we read that. The Ten Kings, which you saw, are, uh, Ten Horns are Ten Kings, which receive no kingdoms yet, receive power as kings when armed with beast. So these are the ten horns of the ten kings that would be, again, looking at the nations of Europe that will support the papacy in due time. 
when these laws will be passed. But things are going to get so bad that turning to God will appear to be the only solution for survival. There's some truth to that. You, you hear a lot of churches talking about that. And that in itself is not wrong. <laughs> we keep rejecting God in our country, for instance. Well, if you keep rejecting God officially, then you don't have his protection. And we see things. So and that's in the world, too. Um, and so things are going to get so bad that there will be a turning to God, but not in the right way. That's when these laws are put in the nation of Europe will support. Many ask why their church is so cold and worldly. They wonder why is God's law not taught with power and why is sin not condemned? The power's gone out. They say, what is the reason? Revelation 14 8. We looked at that. God's law is fallen. As a rule, you're not going to see the other churches say, oh, yeah, Saturday's the Sabbath. Hey, I think we should keep that. As a rule, now occasionally that's happened. There's been a congregation, for instance, that someone in the congregation comes to learn about the Sabbath, or maybe the pastor, and he's convicted, and then he starts sharing it. And there's been times that there's been congregations that take their stand on the side of the Sabbath. That's rare. That's a tough thing for a pastor to do, by the way. He's got everything at stake, right? Could lose everything. So um, we're not going to see a great wholesale turning of the churches out there to these truths. They're going to stay there, and that's sad. Some feel should try to reform the churches that have fallen. What does God say? He says, no, come out of her. And that's what I'm talking about. Come out of her, my people, that you receive out of her place. There will not be a wholesale turning to the truth of God's word. And part of that fits because, again, wine, the minds have been so confused from the wine of Babylon, it's nearly impossible to change. God calls Christian people who are in Babylon my people, Revelation 18.4, we've seen it. Jesus refers to people who are not in his church as other sheep. What does Jesus say will happen to his other sheep that are not in his fold? John 10, 16. We're on question 17. John 10, 16. Jesus said, Another sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So he says, them also I must bring. So he's calling people out of Babylon. They hear my voice. There shall be one fold and one shepherd. One fold is one truth. There is only one truth. There's not five or six or seven different truths. There's only one truth, and that's the truth of God's word. And those in the end who take their stand and come out of Babylon, they're coming out of falsehood and they're taking their stand on the side of God's truth. That's the key. And it's, they're hearing Christ bringing them that way. In God's church, in Noah's day, those who were to be saved had to enter the ark. Believing was not enough. In Jesus' day, those who would be saved had to enter Jesus' fold. After being called out of Babylon, what must we enter today if we would be saved? Acts 2.47, we see what happened in the New Testament era. Acts 2.47. It says, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church. Daily as such as should be saved. So the church is important to God. Uh, the Lord added to the church daily as should be saved. Um, that, that is so crucial. And again, the church should be founded on God's word. And, and I've mentioned to you before my own personal journey. The only reason I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, 
And this is the only reason. Because I wasn't raised in this. <clears throat> I didn't have a bunch of friends that were in this. Uh, is that the average church follows the Bible more closely than any other church I've found. And as far as I'm concerned, that should be the reason for anybody to be a member of any church. I don't care what church it is. It should be based on the Word of God. Because as we read in one of our studies, uh, Paul called the church uh, the pillar and ground of truth. <laughs> the church is built on the truth of God's Word. So that's why God's calling them out of Babylon, falsehood, take their stand on the side of truth, and that will always be connected with the church. As I said, it's just as necessary for a person to enter God's true church today as it was for people to enter the ark in Noah's day. God always works for the church. It is interesting to me, Paul, the great apostle, amazing things God was going to do through him. And you remember what God did? He was converted on the, on the road to Damascus. Had a vision, hear Jesus talk to him. Amazing thing. Then what did God do? He said, Paul, I want you to go to a certain place and wait. And Paul went and waited and prayed. And then God spoke to Ananias, who was a member of the church, and he sent him to Paul. God always connects his people to the body. And you've heard me talk about that. We need one another. And let me tell you, when these laws start coming in, which we know will come in someday, that you can't buy or sell, and there's actually going to be a death decree in due time. If you don't go along with Sunday, we are going to need one another's prayers. We're going to need to connect with one another. And that, that I'm convinced that would be our greatest joy on earth at that time is the fellowship we have with one another. And Satan will always try to separate you from fellowship. We weren't created to stand alone. You can't do it. We weren't created that way. And so if I come in in Babylon, how will God help me? Um, what does he say will happen to me? He says, if we stay there, we'll be ten takers of sins and receive our plagues. What will your decision be? And that's our own. So that's it. Now, let's see how we do today. Take out your envelope. Be sure your name's on it, please, because we got some certificates to give out Friday, and we want to be sure your name's on it. Full name, not just first name. <laughs> both names. We've seen some turn in just the first name. We need both names for the certificate. Okay. Quick my question. Fill in the blanks. Number one, blank is a symbol in Revelation which means religious confusion. Number two, blank represents churches fallen from grace, not willing to accept reformation. Number three, knowing that the fallen churches, Babylon, have no desire to reform, God calls his what? Honor. Four, Revelation pictures Babylon and the symbolism of a woman riding on a what's she on? And five, God is calling his people out of Babylon into a true church of these last days so they can overcome sin in their lives, be protected from the sun, and live with him forever. Okay, I'll tell you this. What's the symbol of means religious confusion? Babylon, right? What represents the church has fallen from grace? Babylon. Same thing. Knowing that the fallen church is Babylon have no desire to reform, God calls his people. Really shows God's mercy. He knows they're honest in heart, he just knows that they're confused a bit. <laughs> Here, here's the truth. Four, Revelation pictures Babylon and symbolism is a woman riding on a beast. Yeah. And number five, God is calling his people out of Babylon into his true church in these last days so they can overcome sin and their lives be protected from the plagues and live with him forever. Good.
hopefully you got them. And here's your responses up at the top right. Appreciate you putting X's where they apply. Number one, if the book of Revelation is becoming clearer and clearer all the time, put an X in box one. Number two, if you think, if you thank God for the things you are learning, and by God's grace want to go all the way with him, put an X in box two. And number three, if you still have a few questions, but would like us to pray for you, put an X in box three. Okay, our next lesson, Revelation Pageant of Conquest of Feet. It's actually going to get into a prophecy that involved Islam as well. You can get that as you leave, of course. Be sure to turn in your envelopes. And we have refreshments again. And hope you enjoy them as you step back and let's have prayer. Father, we thank you for the time we've had to study. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love, Lord, your understanding. You've called each of us out of confusion to your marvelous word. And we thank you for your spirit that has opened our eyes to see and understand the teachings of the Bible. And Lord, we want to be faithful to you always. So I pray that by your spirit, you continue to put in our heart a desire to yield to you and to the truths of your word. Because we know our Lord's coming soon. And it's only those who built their house on the rock, as Jesus said, which is his word, will be able to stand. And we pray that each of us and our loved ones will be there ready. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming, and we will see you Wednesday morning.